Yeah, it's going down, man. It's Donnie Houston Podcast. Check it out, man. We have a very special guest today. Uh, as you know, man, we, we really uh, celebrate this Houston hip-hop thing, you know what I mean, the Southern culture on the podcast. And a lot of times, uh, I've always talked about the importance of groups like Street Military, you know what I mean? Uh, just one of the, the first super groups uh, to come out this H, man, and, 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 and really make noise, you know, after the Ghetto Boys and all that, and really have an influence um, on the city, you know what I mean? Uh, with today's guest is the CEO of Beatbox Records, which is the home of street military, you know what I mean? He is also a former Houston oiler. Uh, so, hey, man, it's some real royalty in the house, man. Richard Johnson, what's going on, man? Hey, man, it's all good. Glad to be here, man. Yeah, for yes, sure. So what's, so what's new, man? What's new, man? Trying to get everything going, man. Just out here uh, working hard, man. Yeah. Trying to get things going. Yeah. You got, yeah. The, got the online store? We can talk yeah, a we got street that. military brand, you know, a continuation of the brand, bringing it to the new, to the new generation, you know, trying to keep the... Uh, Keep the brand going, man. So we're just stretching it out 2020. So we're trying to get that over to the left, to the right, and all through the middle. And then doing a little beatbox record, still re-releasing the catalog, trying to keep that good classic music going. Yeah. You know, our motto, classic music don't die. Yeah, yeah, that's a fact. That's a fact. So let's talk about, because I mean, you know, a lot of people I have on here, man, they have different backgrounds, but you have a completely different background. (laughs) Coming from the NFL, you know what I mean, being a football player, man. Talk a little bit about just, you know, your football career and everything like okay, that, man. Okay, football career. I grew up in Southside Chicago. I was raised out in, in uh, Southside Chicago. I uh, played my college ball at University of Wisconsin, on Wisconsin with the Badgers. Uh, I got drafted in 85. I got drafted down here at Houston Oilers, came down here. First time down in Houston. Fell in love with the city, man. Had a great time being an Oiler. That's with the uh, Love You Blue days. We were right after, no, we were right after Love You Blue. We were the House of Pain game. House of Pain. Bad Boy. Yeah. Jerry Glanville, Warren Moon, uh, and all that. We were in the back in the dome rocking it real good. Exciting. This is when the, no, this, we're talking about the Houston Oilers, man. You yes, know what I mean? Boy. You're talking about the Astrodome, man. This is, this is classic, classic times, man. Yes, it was. A great time to be a Houston Oiler, too. A yeah. lot of fun, a lot of excitement, man. House of Pain, we had it rocking. Had a coach that let us pretty much, uh, I wouldn't say run wild, but we ran wild. Was doing everything, everything and anything we wanted to do. You talking just, about on the field or off the field? Or just mainly general? on the field, but, you know, a little bit off the field. It wasn't as close scrutiny as it is now. now a lot of stuff we did back then you couldn't get away with today. What you mean, like, like what? Like you know, the way we hung out, doing crazy things left and right. I mean, I don't think they can get away with the media coverage now. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. we had a good time on the field and off the field. Yeah, yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah, so, I mean, while you're in the league, though, talk about uh, talk about the, the influence of hip-hop, you know what I mean? Because I would imagine it had an influence on you just kind of before you even jumped into having a label, you know oh, what I mean? Oh, yeah, it did. When I got down here, it was different coaches. I think Ghetto Boys were just blowing up. NWA and all that was blowing up with the, uh, the West Coast style. And then a friend of mine introduced me to uh, uh, DJ Screw, and I got met with Screw. I was like, man, what is that? What is that? Because, you know, from the north. Wait, wait, wait. So you met Screw before you had beatbox and all this? No, no, no. I never met Screw. Okay. I never met him. Just the music, I mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. After I put Street Military out, that's when he said, man, I love them boys, man. You put them boys. I said, yeah, I put them boys out. (laughs) I had met his manager, and he was telling me about it. We were supposed to do something with Street uh, Street Military. was supposed to do something with Screw. But uh, we never got a chance to do it, you know, before he passed, unfortunately. But when I first got there, I said, man, what is that music right there, you know? And I had met Russell. He had just put the... Um, UGK album. Yeah, the mm-hmm. UGK album, out, man. And they, I think they sampled us a little bit on that UGK. I said, hey, man, y'all using our record, you know? <laughs> And then that's when uh, Pimp C, man, I love them boys. You know, Pimp C was telling me how much he loved street military and all that. Yeah. Yeah, but that's how I got into a friend of mine's introduced me. And then he actually introduced me to the group, street military. He said, hey, man, I want you to meet these young boys, man. I think we met at Bennigan's on 610. About, about what year is this? This was in 91, somewhere in there. Okay. Yeah, 1991, somewhere there I first met those guys. Yeah. And then, uh, as they say, I ended up signing them, and then we... We put a little music together. Yeah. Let me put it that way. We put some music together, tried to get a few things. I met Klondike with those guys also. Yeah. So can you tell me, because before before Street Military was beatbox, they were, what was it, Gerard Records or something like yeah, that? Like yeah, yeah, they had a so, situation. Yeah, so what what was the transition from that to that? I mean, I know, you know, Keep Having ended up like going to jail and all this other type uh, of stuff. Yeah, so is that how you acquired them? Or? I, I didn't know about the, uh, let me see, I'm going to use this word. 
I didn't know about their previous entanglements, but <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know about that. But uh, I had just met them. They had just got off the deal with Gerard or whatever in that situation. I wasn't too familiar with that because I wasn't really into the Houston scene like that. But I learned afterwards, though, but they had just, uh, evidently, they had just left that group, label or whatever. And then that's when I signed them, right after that. Yeah. And so the yeah. first the first project y'all put out was? The Another Hit project. We did Another Hit. Yeah. When I heard that Pharaoh intro, man, I was I was captivated by those. Yeah, guys, man, that damn Pharaoh, that had me going. I said, "This is something I think uh, I'd invest some time and money into." Yeah, and so I ended up investing. Uh, I invested more money than time because I wasn't really hands on per se when we first started. Because you were still in the league at this time. Yeah, I was on my last year, a year and a half somewhere in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But so tell me about um, tell me about street military. And just the guys, can you kind of like describe each guy and something like that? You know what I mean? Describe each guy's street military. Um, this what this what really uh, fascinated me about the guys and made me want to sign them. They were they were all unique guys, and even Nut, you know, even though the hype man Nut, they were all um, five individual distinct styles. You know, they had all distinct styles uh, amongst amongst themselves, and also. Um, Klondike was was pretty much always with him too. So even though he wasn't a member of Street, you know he was always there, you know. But uh, Pharaoh was um, let me see how do I describe Pharaoh? Pharaoh's more outgoing, uh, wicked on the microphone. He's a wickedly clever on the microphone. Love that guy. Pharaoh's uh, very unique style too. Yes, he rap was. style. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I just wish we had been able to do a better job with Farrell than we did. I mean, that situation there was totally unfortunate. It breaks my heart. Just think about that whole situation right there. Not good. Uh, Icy, man, that dude's, man, a talented dude, could scratch his head off. Very talented dude, man. Um, there's no question, man. I heard him on them turntables. He was definitely a master on the turntable. Um, but as far as, mm, Ice and I, we had a little communication issues, though. But other than that, he was a great, great scratcher. We just didn't communicate very well. And I think uh, KB in the group, KB was a more, more lawyer type, more, more down to earth guy. I always, you know, we had our fights here and there, but we would always mend up, and we can always sit down and talk and discuss things. Uh, Nut was pretty pretty good guy too, man. It's definitely unfortunate what happened him with him passing. That definitely uh, was not a good thing, and certainly missed Nut on that. He was a great hype man. I mean, I saw him in concert earlier. And I was like, wow, man, that guy was an entertainer. <laughs> Nut was definitely an entertainer. And then who else was there? And then uh, Flea, Flea. I don't know, man. Flea and I had a a strange relationship. You know, I mean, we were. We worked together, but I don't think you were. We wouldn't be the type of guys to go out and have a drink together. But other than that, it was a good bunch of guys. And then Klondike, one of my favorites was Klondike. Very talented. Klondike could sing, rap, reggae. I mean, we should have put an R&B album out on Klondike. Yeah. That's how good he can sing. Yeah, that I dude, eat them vocals, man. Yeah, He is an R&B master, man. Klondike yeah. is all that, man. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah, pretty much the street military end of that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so y'all, so y'all do another hit, and that that builds a buzz around the city and everything like that. And then the next project, what was that next project? I think the next project was the uh, signing the Wild Pitch deal, the Don't Give a Damn deal. The Don't Give a Damn was next. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because we did. Um, no. Yeah, we did. No, I think. Yeah, we did another. Uh, the Don't Give a Damn, because after that, we did the remix of Aggravated Roster, was another EP. And then after Don't Give a Damn, we came back with the next episode. Yeah. Yeah, and then the rest was a bunch of remixes. Yeah. So with the with the Don't Give a Damn, because y'all did the wild pitch, I mean, this was, you know, you talking about a big deal. You know, they had some acts, you know. It, you know, it seems they didn't really necessarily know to do with street military. Right. Because right. they were with more so New York based. But, I mean, this was a, you know, a pretty legit, you know, legit situation. Yeah, they saw the talent, man. They definitely saw the talent and the, the potential of the group. They didn't want to pay for the talent and the potential of the group. So when they came down here, we were negotiating with them. So they, they were trying to lowball y'all. Oh, they did lowball. They gave me a uh, contract. I said, ain't no way we're going to sign this. You might as well get on out of here. And um, I wasn't going to sign the deal, but the group wanted the deal. They felt like 
it was their opportunity to shine or whatever. But they went on and and took the deal without my blessing. I didn't really want to do that deal. Oh yeah. But you so know, was it? So was it? Was it? Was it a beatbox slash wild pitch? Or was yeah, it, it was a beatbox slash wild pitch deal. I still because I said, hi, right, yeah, y'all want to do the deal? Y'all can do the deal." But I wasn't hundred percent with the deal. So what, what were they? What were they kind of wanting from y'all at the time? Uh, first of all, they they wanted to, to do a couple remixes. They wanted to do a, a EP, and I said, "No, nah, we don't want to do it. I didn't want to do an EP. I want to." Yeah, we're already doing EP. Yeah, I right. said we need to do an album. Y'all come here and do an album. I want to do. And I told him, I said, I didn't want to do no, no remix at all. I want to do a whole new album. They said, no, nah, we don't want to do all that. We want to do an EP and use some of you guys' older music. And so that was another sticking point I didn't like, the fact that they didn't want to do it all new music. I want to do a whole new album. They said, no, nah, we're going to do this. And then I said, all right. And being an athlete and, and doing my thing, I said, okay, I'm going to go ahead. If they want to do it, I ain't going to hold them back. I don't say, well, Richard held us back and didn't take the deal. So I said, go ahead. Y'all want to sign the deal? Go ahead, sign the deal. So it was a beatbox slash wild pitch deal. Yeah. When you when you got into the music industry, did you uh ever seek like guidance or anything to really like get you up on game on how everything went, or you just went in there blind like shit? I got some money, I might have some man, connections. I, you know what I'm I went in there blind, man, <laughs> blind, blind, blind. I had no idea what was going on in music. I just had some money and said, "Oh, that sounds good. Let's let's jump in the record business." So what? So did you have a staff with you? How, how yeah, was, I had how two. Was, I had a guy, Ralph and Eno. They were working with me. Yeah. And I don't know how much experience they had. Well, one of them said he had experience, but you know, but Ralph, my buddy, I know he didn't have experience because I met him uh, doing some other stuff, real estate work that I was doing because I was doing real estate at the time. So we all went in there pretty green. We didn't know exactly what we were doing. Yeah. Yeah, I admit that we did not. I know I, for sure I didn't know what I was doing. I learned as I went. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But I mean, you guys put out Don't Give a Damn with Wild Pitch, and I mean, it may not have done what it was supposed to do on a national scale, but the impact that it had here, you know what I mean, it can't be denied. You know what I mean? You just talk about that record coming out and just how it affected the city around this time. Because it was already rap a lot and ghetto boys and all these different types of things, but y'all came with kind of a different type of thing. You know what yeah, I mean? It did. It, it made an impact when, when Don't Give a Damn came out. Um, the Tears came for This Dream, the lead single, and it was a new single, which I thought was a great idea to put that new single out there. And it, and it really got a response. I don't think... I don't think Wild Pitch had their situation with EMI real tight because they were saying, well, we got to wait on EMI, do this and do that, you know, because when it came out, man, they did a video for it, but I don't think they really, really pushed it, you know. They just played it here in the soft a little bit, but I don't think you got to push the dessert. Yeah, yeah. So tell me this, when you when you got into the industry, cause I mean, you come from being an athlete, you know what I mean? You say y'all were wild and partying and things like that, but like, I had Zero on here, and he was saying, like, he would go to parties in, like, street military really be about all the shit they was rapping about. You know what I mean? It was a wild bunch of guys, man. Like, talk about just, you know, just you coming from where you from, and you like, man, all right, these, you know, it's a wild bunch they of were, kids right here. They were pretty wild, especially uh, Pharaoh and Nut were probably the two. They were the loudest ones. They were too loud. Ones. The rest <laughs> of them were pretty reserved, but Pharaoh and Nut, that Pharaoh, I mean, I've seen Pharaoh do a lot of wild stuff, man. And, um, he he definitely lived up to his lyrics. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, he lived up maybe a little bit too much to his lyrics. Yeah. You know, maybe I should have tamed him back a little bit, you know. Did you ever try to step in and be like, hey, man, you know, y'all might want to calm down on some of this or some of that? Or I did with Pharaoh, Pharaoh, because, I mean, I actually moved Pharaoh in a couple of my places. You know, I had to move him in. I moved him in in, in a couple of my apartments. So I was trying to keep an eye on Pharaoh. You know, me and his mom, as a matter of fact, I think she moved in with him once, you know, but. Is he one of the, is he probably, you, you consider probably your closest relationship within street military? Probably Pharaoh, yeah. Pharaoh was definitely the more one I was closer to. That's the one who I did the solo, because he and I did the solo project. Yeah, I did the Six Foot Giant. Six Foot Giant, yeah, yeah. That's when we did that. And then we did the um, uh, Gangsta Freestyle. We went up there. We did that with uh, Mike Moe, by the way. Mm -hmm. Me and Pharaoh, we drove up to Prairie View, you know, went and did that uh, Gangsta Freestyle album. And I mean, when we did that, we went up to we went up to Prairie View, did the album with Mike Moe and Bell Wade Records, man. I really saw the essence of Pharaoh. I mean, he went there and he just rapped all night long, man. He, that dude could rap for the next two or three days. He was just gone. Yeah, just rapping, man. I just saw his pure raw talent there. That guy's definitely a raw talent guy. Yeah, 
and and we didn't really get to see him evolve. Because I mean, when you listen to his lyrics now, back then, just think if he was still making music, how much he had evolved. What it would have been, yeah, yeah. I mean, he would be out of here, man. There'd be no question where uh, Pharaoh would be, man, because he was definitely clever. He was on a different level back then. So I mean, it's just man. That was a miss for me right there. Yeah, Definitely yeah. a miss. So, so, I mean, around this time, though, I mean, now you're becoming, you know, a, a real label. You know what I mean? Y'all did the Wild Pitch thing. You got Klondike Cat over there. Who are some of the next acts that you bring in? Because, I mean, you were the first one. You know, you had one of the first female MCs. With you Les. brought Les yeah. money in. Yeah. Les could go, man. We did yeah. that. Take care of your business with Les. I think we did Mob. We did the Mob and Music Melody. No, the Lyrical Lion. We did Klondike's EP. After that, you know, finally gave Klondike shine on that. We did Klondike that one. And then we did his Mob and Music Melody, which is a great album. I love that album. Uh, that was a great album. We had a lot of fun doing that. We did that with the late Maestro over at Maestro, Maestro. Sample 5 Studio. Mm-hmm. I love Maestro. Rest in peace, Maestro. We did that with him, Klondike. And then Les Money came in, and Les could rap, man. We did a, I think we did an EP on Les Money, and we did that over at, uh, with Richard to Simplify. Richard here, okay, yeah. Yeah, because yeah. I pretty much let, let him say wherever you feel comfortable, just let me know where you want to go. Yeah, know? and I, I, I want to say, uh, was it Crazy C and like Stick worked on their project? Yes, they did. They were yeah. yeah, that's actually who told me about because I hadn't heard of Liz, you know what I'm uh-huh. saying? And then they came on here and they were like, yeah, man, you need to check out Liz Monet. Yeah, like, Crazy C did a track yeah. for us on there. Him and Harvey Love was on there. Yeah. That, too Black, Too Strong. Liz did a great, Liz is a great rapper now. Les doing bigger and better things now. He's in real estate or something she's like that. Selling right? half of Houston, boy. Yeah. Les, Les is, Les has definitely evolved for the better. She's, she's on a, a high trajectory. Les is doing real well. Yeah. Very proud of Les Money. That money is definitely deserved in her name. Les Money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But we did that. We did. G Rap came in. He was one of the producers who worked on Bam's album. Okay, I was going to ask you about about G Rap. G Rap and Bam came in. And that's when I uh, purchased the X-Bam albums. Okay. Was, I think it was after I did. What you say purchase? So these albums were already already done? They were already out yeah, before? Yeah, the three albums. The, uh, it was the Bam album, the KB and the Flea album, and the Falcody album. Mm-hmm. Those albums were already done. They were already put out by X-Bam with J.O. Okay. Then I sat down with J.O. We worked out a deal. And it, it seemed like it was in the inevitable for us to come together because all these guys are all in the same. Yeah. yeah, all them beatbox artists, all of them was all over the album. So it came in and just, it was a good fit. So we merged them out. And then we did a BAM second album. And then we did the G-Rap album. Yeah. Talk a little bit about BAM, uh, just like kind of where he's from and just the type of artist he is, type of personality, all that. Yeah, BAM, when BAM, I started working with BAM. BAM was... Bam was Bam was a different type of guy there. Bam was. Bam took me a while to get used to Bam style. When you say different, what you mean? Man, Bam would come in one way one day, and the next day I don't know who's coming in. You know? <laughs> he he would definitely change up on me, man. So when we were working on his album, man, you know, it took us a little while to get through it. But we finally got through that album. Bam had some he was dealing with some some personal stuff he was dealing with, but we finally got through with that album. And um I would say I was, it was a good deal. I was excited about Bam and his album. Yeah. You know, I haven't talked to him in a while. I used to see him, but I haven't saw Bam in a couple of years now. Yeah. 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 But, I mean, he put out some good music, man. It was just, I mean, when I think about those three albums when they coming over from X Bam and, and merging with what we did, it really just fit, it just fit real well together. You know, and right now, as I, you know, look right now and look at the catalog and see it all laid out. It all works together, like the back on the uh, Don't Give a Damn album. It's just, it was a good thing to put them. They really merged well with us. Great catalog. Yeah, and so you were saying G Rap was initially his producer. Yeah, G Rap and Bam did that first album. G Rap was a producer. G Rap was a great producer. Then he did his album, uh, Military Minds, and he had all the guys on there from K Reno to Falca T. And then uh, Bam, he had Street Military on there. He had a Gorilla Ma record on there, Falcon. It was a great album. And he had some other guys in there. I don't, I, if I, I think that was one of the albums that, I, if I had it did it now, I would have promoted it a little differently. Because it yeah. was a great album. Yeah. It didn't get his due, though. Yeah. The album did not get his due, but it was a great album. Yeah. It had some great features on there. And so, and so with the, uh, 
the faculty. Can you talk a little bit about the faculty? Yeah, the faculty, um, I met them afterwards. And the one who I was mainly talking to, uh, let me see, I talked to V, I see uh, Water now, and I, I just uh, talked to Cook a while. But Malik, I was talking to Malik. He had reached out to me, and it was unfortunate that he reached out a couple weeks before he uh, passed. He was saying, hey, man, I want to do another album like you did with Bam. So we said, I said, Malik, man, whenever you're ready, let me know. I would love to do y'all's second album, man. But before we got a chance to do it, man, you know, he had that unfortunate incident. He, he got killed. Yeah. But we're going to definitely do something with Malik. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I like Malik. Yeah, and so, okay, once you, I mean, we talk about those, but, and we kind of touched on it a little bit, but talk about the decision to do a solo album with Pharaoh. Cause he does a six foot giant. I mean, that's like a like an underground classic. You know yeah, what I mean? it is, man. Um, I think what made me um, uh, it what made me want to do uh, Pharaoh's album was when Wild Pitch came down here. Wild Pitch really reinforcing, you know, because I was like, man, that dude's special, man, he good, you know. And I was kind of doubting. I was like, hey. but Wild Pitch when they came down here, they reinforced that Pharaoh was something special because they were raving over Pharaoh. Hmm. Yeah, they were even saying, well, maybe we'll do a a, a, a solo album on Pharaoh and down the line said, nah, I'm going to do a solo album on Pharaoh. No way. Y'all need to concentrate on trying to get this group album going. Yeah. But they, they were interested in Pharaoh too, man. But uh, I said, no, I know I'm going to put Pharaoh's album out. So, And that's what we definitely did. Got our Pharaoh album out. And um, we were really excited about that album too. You know, Pharaoh ran into a little trouble when we were trying to uh, let me see, promoted or whatever. But other than that, what, what happened with that? What, what you? Uh, he was going through a little situation where he had a couple of run-ins with the law, mm -hmm. you know, and that kind of uh, kind of slowed things down. And then he was doing with some personal issues here and there. But if we could have kept him straight, man, I think we could have did a better job on that album. Yeah, yeah. yeah you know, because you're trying to decide, do I put money on this and that, you know? But if we would have kept him straight, we could have probably put a little bit more money behind that album. Yeah. No question. Yeah, and I mean, and Pharaoh ends up because I, I don't know if you want to talk about it, but it's, I can't really get a clear story on like it just says like Pharaoh has got like fifty years in jail or something like that. Like, what really happened with all with the whole like yeah, situation well, with that? Without going too far, he he got into a little bad situation one night and end up doing some things that you know he say she say or something. He he said he didn't do it or he didn't remember it, so it just got. As they say, he got caught up, you know, on a, man, it was, man, 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 he just got caught up, man, and he ended up, man, going to see it, seeing that judge, and man, ended up there and getting him, oh, man, I, I mean, it just, man. That's man, a lot man. of time, you know what I mean? 50 yeah, years is a lot it's, of time, man. Man, that's a whole lot of time, man. Don't like that at all. Yeah, he ended up getting 50 years, man. Yeah. Which is way overkill. Yeah. Way overkill. You know. Tried to talk to some people, try to see if we can work some out, but who knows? We don't know. Maybe something happened in the future. Yeah. That we can get him out. Yeah. You still keep in contact with him and everything like that? Uh, I talked to, to him through his mom. I'll, I'll go through his mom, and, you know, go through that way, you know. But other than that, you know, I never went down there or down there to see him. I haven't seen him since he went in. Yeah. No, I don't think I want to go see him in there. So I probably, be honest, I probably won't go down there. No, 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 no. Wouldn't want to see him in the cage. Yeah. No. Yeah. So, I mean, y'all do the, uh, y'all do the solo Pharaoh album, but then you also do the KB and Lil Flea. So how does, when do they start kind of breaking off into these solo things? Does KB and Lil Flea happen because Pharaoh goes solo or was that already kind no, of planned? No, they, I think, no, KB and Flea were already considering going solo. They had already left and did the album with uh, X-Band. Okay, okay. KB and Flea left and did the album with X-Band. And they were always, I mean, KB and Flea were always a tight two. They were a tight two niche like that. And they went out and did the record with X-Band. And then... Um, then it ended up coming back with, to us through the purchase of X Bam, yeah. the masters through that way. But they had already left and did their thing. They were doing their own thing. Yeah, they've always were a two-headed monster, so to speak. Okay, okay. Yeah, they were definitely two-headed monster over there. Yeah. Yep. KB and Flea. Yeah. So, yeah. 
I mean, uh, do you have a favorite project that y'all released? The favorite projects? Let me see. My two favorites was the Pharaoh and the Klondike Cat Mob and Music Melodies and the G-Rap album. Hmm. And my most disappointing one was the Steel Gangster album. Hmm. The Steel Gangster album should have been our superstar album. Should have been the album that took us to a different stratosphere. Yeah. Yeah, but some very unfortunate things happening on that one and some of the some of the hurt that we went through in there still still felt to the day it was a lot of hurt on that album so so what was kind of going on with the uh like during that time and everything um well i think it started with uh the don't give a damn album back in there we had a bunch of we had a bunch of disagreements on that like i said i wasn't too big on that deal but they wanted to do that deal. And y'all did, it was a, that was a one album deal. And y'all, we yeah, had one album. album. We never went back. They didn't want to mess with it again. But the weird part about that, the backstory on that is uh, um, wasn't getting any money on it. Don't give a damn. But the little advance that they had got, you know. But I didn't get any money on the don't give a damn deal because I, I didn't think it was fair because I didn't like it. So I didn't take any money from don't give a damn. But after a while, you know, uh, on the contract that we signed with them, we, we pretty much gave them all our rights on the contract with Wild Pitch Records. They pretty much had everything. They owned everything. Is this one of the reasons why you were against it? Yeah, I mean, it was a rough contract. I mean, they came, the boys from New York don't play. You know, yeah. they come down. You know, you hear Pimp C talk about them. Yeah. Know? They don't play. So what I did was uh, I put Don't Give a Damn out by myself. Um, we, re- we released it. And then Wild Pitch got word that we had re-released it, and I had re-released it through Robert. Wait, 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 wait. How did, how did, you, how did you do this? Uh, I, just being foolish. I mean, I didn't know how the game worked. I figured, hey, <laughs> we can put this I won't get something out. off of this album. Yeah, yeah you yeah. know, well, we can make, because I figured we could sell, because I think they, they sold quite a few, few units on that album, but we didn't get any money on it, you know, because they said it was. It recoup and all that, yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah. know, they hit you with mm-hmm. that recoup, but it's so pretty well that if we had to put it through Robert, we'd all made money. Through Southwest. Yeah. Yeah. So I kind of put it together, put it back through Robert. <laughs> Try to be slick. I put it back through Robert. Wait, wait, wait. How, how long did you wait to re-release it from their release? Well, it was a couple years. Because okay. we were sitting around. They didn't want to do anything. They were sitting around. They had lost the uh, Wild Picture had lost their deal with EMI. So they said, ah, we're not too interested in doing things. And, you know, and I'm thinking, well, if they don't want to do anything, I can do any. I can. I could do something with. Did they at least fund the video? Yeah, they fund. They the fund video. the video. Okay. Yeah. yeah, they fund the video. So I put it out through Robert. Then they found out. And they came down there. They sent Robert, me and Robert, a cease and desist. Yeah, they came after me. They said, "Whoa, whoa, whoa!" I said, oh, "I just thought we can put it out." They said, "No, nah, it don't work like that, buddy." So what they told me, "Well, look here, buddy. Since you put it out, we gonna let you buy it." So they had sued me. And so that's when I went to Robert, and Robert helped me out. I saw Robert. Robert Gillum is a, yeah. that's an angel. Robert helped me out because I mean they were coming after me personally. They found out I was a ball player and everything. Oh, of course, yeah, yeah. So yeah. they wanted to sue me. How I much? Mean, how much? If you don't mind, how much were they trying to, to sue you uh, for? Man, they were, it was a six figure, high six figure number. I was like, man, we didn't even make, make this on money. That's what yeah, I'm saying. Yeah. We make that kind of money, man. And so they gave me a number. They said, all right, if you want to get out of this trouble. Um, you can buy the rights back in the masses. So I had to cut a check, man. Right. Yeah, I had to, but, but it was a good In the end, it pays off, though, because you yeah, still do stuff like check. this. Yeah, it was a big check, but it did pay off because, I mean, they owned everything, the masses, the name, you name it, likeness, M&M, oh, everything damn. was tied in there. So I had to cut that check, man. It was a big check, so. They own the name of God. Yeah, man, I had to buy all that back, man. So I ended up buying it all back. You know, and I'm looking at my balance sheets now. That's why I say I'm doing my street military brand. You know, we got to make some yeah, y'all go, money back. Yeah, yeah, y'all, y'all go, y'all go get we this merch, make man. We got to money yeah. back, man. I mean, we can't <laughs> stop, you know, just because the guys are grown, they're older. You ain't going to make it out doing records with them. You know, they, they're doing their family things. They're doing their little things. So you got to find a way to look at the balance sheet and how do we get money off of Elf and Asset. We got we to squeeze money out. That's where we came with street military brand doing it. Closing line, yeah. You know, you gotta get, gotta get paid, man. Yeah. Were there any other opportunities after the Wild Pitch deal? Were people coming in trying to like maybe do some 
the distribution of partnerships with y'all as far as on a major label? Uh, no, no, not really. We didn't get any more deals after that. But what we did was, and after all that that we had been through, because it, it got pretty, uh, you know, when you do an album, nobody makes money. You know the group's going to be mad. They're going to fight with me. So everybody's mad at me, you know. But uh, we sat down and we did, we came, I think, me, again, the two-headed monsters, KB and Flea, and I sat down. And we, we said we're going to start all over, and we did, let's, uh, let's do one more album. And that's when we decided to uh, bring in some new producers, and we're going to up the different sound. I don't want to say up the sound, it's just a different sound, because we went in and got uh, MJG and all that sound mm -hmm. came in on the Steel Gangster. Totally different that sound than the album. And we sat down, worked out a deal with that, and we, were in, and we did that album, man, but just some... Funny things happened on that album, man, that that really shouldn't have went down the way it did. If we were like just, what? What you mean? Well, well, when MJG and when their production company finished producing the album, and I got the album, took it over, Robert. We got us, we got a cease and desist at Southwest Wholesale because Robert was excited about the album. Robert loved Street Military. It was one of his great groups. He loved them guys. And so when he heard that, I let him hear the Steel Gangster album. When he heard that, he said, yeah, Richard, we're going we gonna to get behind you. We're going to push this album because this is where these guys need to be. They need to be up there with the Ghetto Boys and UGK. They're right there with them. And now y'all getting it right. Y'all getting the features, getting, getting the, the music. Yeah, Exactly. Yeah. That album was ready to go. But, um, man, we got sued by, uh, by the guys out they had when they did the album in Memphis. And we ended up getting sued by the guys in Memphis. So, you know, when you put a record out and you hear somebody come in and sue, you know, I don't think Robert and all of them was excited about hearing that. All right, right. What, what, so, what was What was there to sue over though? Well, I had let them go up. They said, hey, Rich, we're going to do the deal. You provide the money. So I gave them all the money. I said, I go up there and buy the tracks and everything. So they went up there and bought the tracks, you know, in Memphis, because the album was done in Memphis. And they did a little bit of it here in Houston. But evidently, you know, I don't know which way, but evidently somebody went up there and signed a deal up in Memphis, signed some paperwork that that didn't uh, that didn't didn't bode well. Like a producer, like a production deal or something a like that. Production label deal. Oh man! When you're already on a label, you go sign a deal up there. You know, it was. Did they I, knowingly do that, or yeah, is this just see, something that's, just happened? See, that's where this this animosity is right now that I have. And, you know, because me and Fleet, we, we don't even talk behind this deal right now, you know. And, and it's something I can't forgive him for, you know. But I talked to KB because, I mean, he came and he came to me like a man and he apologized. So we, we cool on that. But it was it was it was it was just some it wasn't it wasn't a good deal for them what they did up there in Memphis, and then I'm end up getting sued again. Right, right. You know. So, so what what would be the reason to sign a production deal if y'all already buying the tracks? Yeah, I don't know what happened, man. Man, you have to talk to them, ask them that. I don't know. Yeah. You know, maybe I said too much. I don't know if they want me to say that, but but that's what slowed that album down, and it just it just didn't get legs under. it. But it was a great album. So you ended up having to pay a, a tab behind. Yeah, yeah, another tab, man. That's what I'm saying, man. I'm, I'm writing too many checks, man. Yeah. Yeah, not getting enough. You know, it ain't coming time. in. Yeah. And yeah. That was another check I wrote, man. You know, and, and didn't get a return on. Damn. It was a big check, too. Another big check, you know. But, you know, I'm a grown man. I signed it, you know. I, I put the money in. Nobody put a gun to my head telling me to do it. You know, but you you live and you learn, man. You man. And you learn. So man, so even around this time, you st still you still kind of just figuring it out the whole time. Yeah, I'm figuring it out, and you trusting people, man. You know, I think that's hurts me more. You know, you trust somebody, you know, you expect them to do do what they say they're gonna do. You know? Yeah, and it just turned out to be a bad situation, man. Because I mean, I love that Steel Gangster album, you know, and I gotta admit that. Um, you know, Farrell was going through his issues at the time, too. This is when this, his case was going on and everything like that? Uh, his case, no, I think his, his lifestyle was a, was an issue. Okay, you know, yeah, he yeah. He was having some lifestyle choice issues, so, you know, he's going in. Because he's, he's not on it as much as we would hope to be on it. Yeah. yeah. But it's a good album, though. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a good album. Man. man. 
Well, I mean, even even through all of that, man, you know, you were still able to to do some legendary things, man, that are marked in history forever. You know what I mean? And influence people that went on to to be great, like a zero. You know what I mean? He's yeah, gonna always yeah, talk yeah. about bam. He's gonna always talk about street military. You know what I'm saying? Um, I mean, just talk about. I mean, is there any? Do you feel anything with that, like man? Well, at least I, 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 I always made my mark. You yeah, know what because I mean, I mean, I, I look at uh, zero. It, a lot of people say he, he's. You can tell he he listened to Pharaoh, but I think it's a different, total different style. His style is way different from Pharaoh. But I, I mean, I can see the growth on him. And I love seeing him, and I like how he represents. He always shouts them boys out. He 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 really does shout them out. And uh, uh, he's 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 very proud of where he came from. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm happy for Zero. Yeah, yeah. Yes, sir. So Beatbox Records, what do you want the legacy to be for Beatbox Records when it's all said and done? All said that we we, we we put out some good music. I mean, some albums that continue to sell like Motown. Like I always tell them, man, you put out a classic album, they always going to sell. They're not going to get old. You know, and you look at some of the uh, records that we put out, I'm listening to some. I said, man, I could do a, I could do a top 10 uh hot mix of to what's going on in the streets of America right now and just take my own music. The soundtrack is already there. And that's something I wish these younger kids were doing more of, more street music, you know. More and, of the commentary, yeah. Yeah, I yeah. mean, right now, because they, they, can, they can definitely benefit from what's going on. They are definitely going to be the beneficiaries if they do it right, of what's happening right now, with everybody being woke. If we can get them woke also. Yeah. Wake up, but... We have music that, I mean, it stands the test of time, you know. You know, and I still listen to it, and, and it, it resonates to what's going on today, man. Yeah, so yeah. Put me a top ten, the streets are talking right now. Yeah. Some of that music, man. Because y'all don't know what the young brothers are going through. through they yeah. didn't know. Yeah. And then you see with George Floyd, rest in peace, what he went through. That's what the young brothers are going through, man. Yeah, yeah. Definitely, man. Maybe I'll give him a a video director, somebody remix the song. Put something together. Yeah, yeah, why not? Why not? It's, it's relevant today. Yeah. I mean, that song is definitely going to be today. Yeah. I have to do that. I'm going to have to go find me a producer, somebody who can do that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, one of these young vig- videographers or something. Yeah. As they say they are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, put that together. So, you had, you, had the, you had the great football career, great hip hop career. Which one would you choose? Or could you choose between the two? Oh, it's a tough one. But the way things turned out to me on the music end, I definitely took football. <laughs> football pays the bills, man. Yeah, football yeah. pays the bills. Football did a lot for me, brought me a long way. Football got me into a career of a, more investing. I mean, I got into real estate because of football, and that's that's what really sustained me. It allowed me to go out here and take these shots, as they, these moon shots. I mean, music was a moon shot for me. Yeah, you know, so I went and did that. Now, you know, I'm trying to circle back and do a few things with the closing line, do a street military brand, a few things there, and also I get a lot of people asking for those old albums, man. I yeah. do get a lot of people asking, man, put that album back out, man, re-release it, man. But I tell people it's hard when you got over 20 albums, man. It's hard keeping all those albums in stock because it costs money to do all that. And you don't know when the money gonna come back, you yeah. know. And I always say, yeah, you think it's easy being a CEO until you're sitting in there. You got to decide bunch of product. which <laughs> album do you put us? Which one gonna sell? It ain't easy, man. Yeah. You know. And then you got group members. They see a new. Yo, you put the album back. I, man, you That's owe me some money. Yeah. <laughs> they want to check right away. They like say, hey man, I just put it out, man. Got to sell, you know. Yeah. But it would be nice if, if, you know, if they were still active, I could probably sell more. But you know, I know they they're grown now. And hopefully they're doing their own thing. So yeah, yeah, yeah. But football would definitely be the one I would choose if I had to do it again. <laughs> no question. Even though I love the entertainment industry. Yeah, right? yeah. So man, any last words, man? Before we get about here, man. Anything you want to? No, man. Oh, well, just want to know we dropped the uh, "Don't Give a Damn" on video picture desk, man. I mean, we had to come back and do that again. It's been getting a great response. On a lot of people are saying, "Man, that's a great album." But then the only thing, when you gonna do this one? You gonna do the Pharaoh album? You gonna do the Klondike album? You know, now there you go. Those decisions being a CEO. Yeah. Do you do another album? Do you do the Bam album? The KB? Everybody, was the Falcati album? Which one you gonna do next? I'm like, man, I gotta see which one I can make money. Which on one gonna fast. make the most sense? Yeah. There you go, man. Because yeah. it costs yeah. money to start producing all that old stuff. Though. Yep. 
Yeah. Well, that's what's up, man. That's Listen, it. man, it's been an honor, man, and a pleasure to have you come through Glad the show, to man. Glad be here, man. No doubt. Uh, definitely great. dope to hear about uh, just the history, man, and yeah, just everything, man, man that, you, that you've contributed to. Um, but hey, it's the Donnie Houston Podcast. Richard Johnson, we out. Peace. Donnie Houston.